On behalf of the Centers of Medicare and Medicaid Services, the Administration on Aging, and the Indian Health Service, I would like to welcome everyone to the Long-Term Services and Supports webinar series. My name is Julie Cahoon, and I, will, and I work for Kaufman and Associates. I will be the moderator for today's webinar. Before we begin, I would like to highlight a few features of, our, of your webinar interface. First, you can see the first PowerPoint slide of the presentation in the main window to the left side of the screen, and the Q&A box is in the, right, is in the bottom right-hand corner. Just above the Q&A box is the, web, is the web links feature, which provides external links to two resources. If you highlight the title of a link and click the Browse To button, your webinar browser will automatically open the web page in your internet browser. To return to the webinar screen, please minimize your internet browser. During today's webinar, a video will be shown. In order to watch and hear the video, you will need to be logged into the Adobe Connect platform. If you need technical assistance during the webinar, please enter your tech support question into the Q&A box. Our tech support staff will be monitoring these questions throughout the webinar, and we will work to answer your tech support questions right away. You will receive an answer in the Q&A box. Finally, please be aware that today's webinar is being recorded and that the recording will be made available online in the near future on CMS.gov. With those announcements made, I would like to welcome everyone to today's webinar. Today's webinar is titled Elder Abuse Prevention Resources in Indian Country, National Indigenous Elder Justice Initiative. Our presenter today is Dr. Jackie Gray. Dr. Gray is a Choctaw Cherokee Associate Professor and Associate Director at the Center for Rural Health at the University of North Dakota. She is also the Director of the National Indigenous Elder Justice Initiative that is funded by the National Center on Elder Abuse and Title VI programs of the Administration for Community Living to address the issues of elder abuse in Indian Country. Dr. Gray has worked to address health, mental health, and health disparities across Indian Country. Internationally, she has worked with Maniori on suicide prevention. Dr. Gray is a mental health first aid instructor and was part of the Rural Mental Health First Aid Initiative. She has worked with tribes across the country for over 35 years. She received her doctorate from Oklahoma State University in 1999 and has been at the University of North Dakota since 1999. I will now turn it over to Dr. Gray. Thank you, Julie. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you all for, for listening in today. Uh, I've got a little bit of a rough voice, so I'm going to try to make it through okay with uh, speaking while we do this. Uh, this webinar is focused on the resources available on the NIJI website, and NIJI is the National Indigenous Elder Justice Initiative. Uh, this, this initiative is a National Resource Center for Indigenous Elder Abuse Information and Technical Assistance, and it's to used to increase awareness about elder abuse in Indian Country, to provide culturally relevant materials on elder abuse, to provide technical assistance to Indigenous groups on establishing elder abuse codes, policies, and services, and to increase the data available uh, about uh, indigenous elder abuse. So what exactly is elder abuse? It's not something that is, is common to our culture historically. So the National Center on Elder Abuse says that it's any knowing, intentional, or negligent act by a caregiver or any other person that causes harm or a serious risk of harm to a vulnerable adult. Uh, taking these official definitions sometimes is, is difficult in Indian country because we don't like to be considered vulnerable adults. Uh, we don't like to look at people doing intentional harm or neglect to an elder. But, and many times you hear uh, elders in Indian country, not, when they ask about elder abuse, it's no, they've not, not been abused. But when you ask about disrespect, you start hearing the stories. And so that is a term that's more commonly used. 
We're going to focus today on the NIGI website and what's available on that site. So I've got a number of screenshots to show you what it actually looks like. And as Julie mentioned at the beginning, the NIGI link under resources will take you to that website, but make sure that you minimize that window so that uh, you can come back into the webinar if you go there. This is our home page, and the uh, you know our our logo is up here in the my arrow in the the left. And Niji focuses on restoring respect and dignity by honoring indigenous elders, which is our vision. Uh, it tells a little bit about our program here on the home page, and then uh, any free, you know, uh, current or featured events and things like that is usually in a box just to the right of the screen. Farther down on the home page, there's more information about elder abuse awareness videos. And we have uh, one of those that we have, We've had several, but we have one on our website right now. And it lists some elder abuse taglines in the tribal language and in English. And uh, I'll let uh, Julie play the video now, and then we'll come back and talk a little more about things that uh, can be done with that. Hi, Jackie. Actually, I'm going to hold for just a second. It looks like we're having some audio problems, so I'm just going to wait to play that video for just a second. Okay. Hi, Ushuna. I stand for dignity. Hi, Imumwada. This is Chuck. I will not stand for elder abuse. The time is now. Unite against elder abuse. Break the silence. Elder abuse is not traditional. Elder abuse is not our way. Okay, Jackie, you can go ahead again again. All right, thank you, Julie. Um, from the uh, the PSA that was on, uh, you can hear that, that part of it was listed, it was in the tribal language, part of it was in English by some of our students and staff. What we can do, and there's information, let me get the arrow again, wherever it ended up. I can't find the arrow now. But uh, it, where it says, learn how to submit your video, that's a hot link that you can click on, and it will tell you if you want to do one uh, with your tribe and your language, uh, how to go about doing that and submitting it to us, and we'll edit it together with the taglines, or you can do it yourself, and we'll put it all together uh, so you can have one that you can utilize in your own community with your own tribal language. If you have any questions about that, feel free to contact us. One of the next pages, if we go up to the, the top of the banner, uh, the resources tab, and you click on that, it'll take you to this page, which lists several different things, whether it's news and events, upcoming conferences, seminars, other events that are going on, publications, uh, different documents and other things that we have that are helpful with relationship to elder abuse. Sometimes there's fact sheets and things like that. Presentations, 
examples of products. The other thing I'll say about presentations is any of our PowerPoints that are up there, feel free to take those and adapt them and use them. Uh, same with product examples. These are examples that different programs have sent to us of things that they are doing around elder abuse so that you can get some ideas of some of the things you can do. And then websites and tools. And each of these will take you to another page under the news and events. As I said, we've got uh, one of the uh, elder abuse prevention grants that was received from Title VI program, Stelma Whitewater at Winnebago, was presented an award on elder abuse prevention. And so we've got that up there. Uh, World Elder Abuse Awareness Day is June 15th each year. And there may be other events going on. We usually have something uh, here at Niji, and then there are other things that other programs do throughout the world. Past events, this list, some of the conferences, World Elder Abuse Awareness Day events and things like that, that we have recorded and made available online. So we go to the next area, which is publications. And you can see these are some of the things that we've put out. There's a quality of life fact sheet. There's one on identity theft with American Indian Alaska Native elders. There's another one about technology use among American Indian Alaska Native elders. We have a booklet that uh, has been used in a lot of, of venues with IHS and with others to help train new staff coming in that may be non-Indian. Just some general information about uh, questions that they may have. We've developed a model civil elder abuse code that deals with uh, things on the non-criminal side. And then we also have a model criminal elder abuse code that uh, tribes can use to help develop their own. And we have an, um, a number of other documents in here that give you information about elder abuse in Indian country. The next section dealing with publications Again, there are different things. There's a number of different tips around financial exploitation and technology tips and things like that. Uh, some, a fact sheet on understanding elder abuse. But a lot of useful information that you can print out and use or uh, make reference to. Under the product examples, as I said, there's a number of different things that have been shared by other grantees and programs that they are doing. Um, this is a, a 2016 calendar. There's a banner that was developed. Uh, one program had a contest with youth to come up with a design to use for a billboard that they were going to put up. Uh, and then some placemats that were developed for use on World Elder Abuse Awareness Day. The other thing we have is, it says a flyer, but it's kind of like a poster. We print these out on um, 11 by 17 uh, heavier paper. Uh, it's called Ways to Love Our Elders poster. And I can show you, this is the top part of the poster. And we have people that have uh, framed these and posted in their senior centers and things like this. Uh, the next slide goes ahead and shows a little lower on the poster. It's, where it's as large as it is, it's hard to get it where you can read it and get the whole thing on one, one slide. So uh, I uh, hope you can get enough of an idea of what it's like that uh, you can see how... Uh, we wanted to keep things as po uh, positive as possible. And so this is one of the things that we developed and able to, in order to do that. The next section is on websites and tools. And as you see, there's a lot of resources here. Some of the things that I'll point out, 
the uh, let's see. We have a we went through all of the states to get their mandatory reporting requirements. Uh, we've got links to uh, all of those statutes. We've got a list to the, the National Center on Elder Abuse that is out of the University of Southern California. Uh, National Congress of American Indians has some good resources. National Indian Council on Aging, or NICOA. And a number of other, there's, there's a lot more resources up here than what you can see just on this page. But all of these are links to really good resources that can help in developing your elder abuse program. Farther down on our list, we again have more um, that are great links to resources that are helpful in working with elders around elder abuse, uh, helplines and hotlines for suspected abuse down here at the bottom, um, all kinds of services and interventions that are helpful. And although there are over 560 federally recognized tribes in the U.S., only a little over 50 have their own elder abuse code. And so all of those that were available that we have permission to, we have linked onto this website and they're listed by the state the tribe is in. So all you have to do is go click on this. If you're planning on developing an elder abuse code, you've looked at the model code, you wanna see how some other tribes have adapted those things, you can go to any of these and see how they've developed the elder abuse codes for their tribe. This is another really wonderful resource. Uh, it's our interactive map. Uh, and on the right, uh, the, the link for the state hotlines will take you directly to this page. Um, again, if you Go to that page. Be sure you minimize and come back into the to come back into the webinar. But you just have to click on your state. So if we click on the state, it will bring up the resources for that state. At the bottom of that page, it also lists out all of the states typed out and their hot links to that state's resources. So you can do it either way, either by clicking on the map or clicking on the name of the state. When you do that, it takes you to a list of hotlines, and this is the one for North Dakota, where we have the tribal hotlines and senior services listed, elder protection teams, elder outreach, and all the resources for tri tribes are listed there. Okay. Whenever there are state resources or for tribes that work with the states and have them do the elder abuse investigations and elder abuse protection, uh, those state resources are also listed. There are over 7,000 uh, numbers listed for the United States in this, in this resource that we have available there. So it's the most comprehensive one that exists for resources on elder abuse in Indian country. Some of the other resources that we'll be at, uh, adding here in the next uh, couple of months is we're developing training modules for legal, policy, financial exploitation, healthcare, social services, and for caregivers. And we're hoping to, or the plan is to have, we'll have a, an entrance gateway and some information about elder abuse and then modules on caregiving, social services, and financial exploitation will be up by World Elder Abuse Awareness Day, which is June 15th uh, this year. Uh, 
as well, we're going to be adding additional resources and more fact sheets as we get them developed. This is our staff, and we also have the pictures up there, so you kind of have a face to put with who it is you may be talking on the phone or emailing with. Uh, feel free to contact us at any time. We want to address your needs as much as we can or direct you to a place that can help to address those needs. And I, you know, encourage you to brainstorm with us if there are, because a lot of the resources don't exist and we're doing our best to develop things as quickly as we can. But uh, as I was explaining to uh, someone a while back, we talk about how do you eat an elephant? And in dealing with elder abuse, what we're finding is we're trying to eat a whole herd of elephants. So there, there's a lot of work to do, and we're getting resources up on the website and available to people just as soon as we can. Sloan Henry is our project coordinator. Brittany Belgard is a project assistant, and Susan Holden is our administrative support person for the NIGI project. So I'll turn it back over to Julie now, and we can do, we have plenty of time to do question and answer. Thank you, Dr. Gray. And I would like to, if you have questions for Dr. Gray, please type your question into the Q&A box um, at this time. I'd also like to note that the webinar is being recorded and that a recording will be made available in the near future. If you're having problems with your audio over the web, I would recommend dialing into the phone lines um, that are listed in the welcome box. So, Dr. Gray, one question that came in is, do you provide a certificate of completion? We haven't uh, set that up yet, but uh, we have discussed it, and I think we're going to try to make it where it will work. Since all of this is going to be online, it's just a matter of getting everything linked into it, and I and that's a, that's the plan is to be able to provide something like that. And another question is, can you help to make the connection between elder abuse and cardiovascular health slash diabetes outcomes? Well, I'll, I'm hoping that what you're asking is what we find with elder abuse is those people that have multiple chronic conditions, whenever there is elder abuse that occurs, they have a much worse outcome with those conditions. There's a higher mortality rate and a much more uh, negative prognosis if elder abuse is going on as well. It's also harder to manage pain. Okay, another question that has come in is, what are several key talking points when training staff in long-term care settings? Well, one, one I think is recognizing the signs of elder abuse and neglect. Another is recognizing signs of stress in themselves and self-care. I think those are probably two key talking points in addressing that kind of training. Okay. Do you know if other tribes are seeking their own assisted living homes? And if there are some, are they successful? Uh, I think it's been about a year and a half ago, we did a site visit at, to Tahona Odom in Arizona. And they have a really nice assisted living facility, and they were planning on building more. And I would suggest contacting them with questions about it, because I was really impressed with what we saw there. 
others I, I'm not sure of, but that one I did visit and I do know about. Okay, Dr. Gray, another question is, can you talk about the interaction between tribes and the long-term care ombudsman program? I really don't know how all of that works together, so I really can't address that specifically. Okay. Another question is, how do folks register for the courses? Uh, it will be on our website where people will just be able to, to go in. And the other thing, it's, it's taking us a while to put this together because one of the things we wanted to do is we wanted it where if people had the highest speed internet and the best equipment, they could have an interactive uh, opportunity for the training as well as those that might have dial up or intermittent ability. And so trying to make it where it will cover all of those different types of settings, we wanted it where everyone would be able to access it. So it's taken a little longer and we're, we're developing all of that. It will be on our website where all you have to do is click to go into it and, and uh, put in any information we need. Okay. Another question is, are there examples of successful practices or tribes that are doing a good job in addressing elder abuse in their communities? Uh, I think Standing Rock, uh, it, it covers North and South Dakota. It's on both sides of the state line. Um, it has a really good program, uh, Warm Springs in uh, Oregon, uh, has a great multidisciplinary elder protection team that I think is doing a great job, and they work in collaboration with the state for investigations. Um, Tahona Odom, I was really impressed when we were down there and uh, saw their adult protective services program. Uh, so, you know, I think there are some. Uh, we can help to direct you to the ones that we know about. And if people know about some and want to share those with us, you know, we would gl gladly accept those those referrals so that we know about programs and can share them with other with other people who are interested in finding out more information. Okay. And here's a a comment and a question. Um, so this attendee appreciated your comment about disrespect versus abuse. Um, she finds that many times when investigating elder abuse, elder co covers up for their family member. Um, do you have any suggestions on how to handle situations like that? That's one of the ways that the elder protection team, I think, is really helpful. And some of those other more restorative justice models um, is that it can really be approached in we want to help your family be healthier. And so if we know what's going on, you know, it's not that we want to punish people unless that's what we have to do. But if there are ways that we can go about, you know, and that's the difference in the civil and the criminal codes. If you have both of them, then they may be able to work through the civil code to kind of set up a treatment plan and work with them and use the, the hammer of the, the criminal code only when necessary, and you can't get people to respond to those positive attempts to make corrections and improvements. And I know Tone Odom has a restorative justice program um, uh, with their adult protective services. Some of the elder protection teams have been very effective with some of these things. And out of the Pueblos, they've uh, gone to some of the traditional elder councils to address some of that that has been very effective. So I think really coming at it from a helping perspective rather than the, the criminal um, punishment type of perspective is how most people perceive authorities and to try to turn that around where they, you're, you're engaging. I know your intent is to help, 
but sometimes it's not perceived that way. So trying to change that perception to a more helping model. Okay, great. Uh, another question that has come in is, when working with an elder with dementia or Alzheimer's, how do you recognize stress or depression? Uh, I'm not sure if it's with the elder or with the caregiver. Those are very stressful situations for caregivers and a lot of need for re for support and respite for those caregivers. But also with the elder, there's a lot of you know confusion, a lot of the anger and lashing out is you know out of fear and and not knowing what's going on, and so that can be very difficult. Um, the VA has a program called Reach. And it's training for caregivers and uh, as far as working with Alzheimer's and dementia. And when I was at the Banner Institute uh, uh, conference for American Indian, Alaska Native, Alzheimer's and dementia last fall, uh, I talked with a number of people that had been trained with that program. And they were very positive about how helpful it was and how to handle different situations and having that caregiver have someone to go to that could to give them ideas on ways to handle situations. And I know that they are the VA is reaching out with their REACH program uh, to do training with uh, tribes. And that information is available through the um, ACL, Administration on Community Living. Okay, great. Um, one question that came in is uh, Adult Protective Services is who investigates elder abuse in, in New Jersey. Um, is there a separate APS type investigation for, for those in Indian country? It varies. Some tribes are what they call uh, Public Law 280 states, in which there is an agreement with the state that the state will do those investigations and uh, the, you know, there's a working relationship between the tribe and the state. Other states where uh, they don't have that, the tribes are sovereign and they may have an individual uh, memorandum of understanding or agreement with the state around those or not. If they don't, some tribes don't have that agreement, don't have an elder protection code, and so there's nothing in place for the elders. Others have their own code, have their own adult protective services that do all of their own investigations. So there are many different types of situations throughout Indian country. Okay, this next question kind of um, falls in, in the line about jurisdiction. But how important is it to implement tribal codes about elder abuse? Do tribal codes apply to people who live off reservation or tribal land? As far as I know, the tribal codes apply to where the tribe has jurisdiction, which usually is within their tribal lands. Um, there is one. One resource that we have on our website is the uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs Adult Protective Services Handbook, which it really outlines the various jurisdictions and how all those different things work. Uh, it, that's one thing that's very confusing in Indian country because it varies a lot as to what is enforced by who. And the Tribal Law and Order Act tried to address that, but most tribes don't have the resources to implement that. And so a lot of progress hasn't been done with it. But there are different tribes in different locations that have made some progress with it. Yeah, one thing that is, is really uh, difficult as far as jurisdiction in Indian country is financial exploitation. If it's something that goes through a bank and the bank is on state land, 
and the elder is on tribal land, and then was it a uh, tribal elder or was it non Indian that did the uh, exploitation? And it's very confusing as to who has jurisdiction with all of that. I'm sorry I don't have better answers, but it's all pretty murky. Okay, the next question um, is about the challenge of or lack of elders reporting abuse, uh, refusal to report elders not admitting to abuse or not willing to complete a police report or refusing to talk to ATS. Um, how much of a challenge is this and what are ways that folks can overcome this? Well, one of the things is talking about the disrespect uh, instead of abuse or uh, in relation to sexual types of things, uh, bothering instead of sexual abuse. You're more apt to get more information. One of the thing, one of the uh, programs I think is really doing a great job is Project Golden Shield out of uh, the uh, um, Anadarko Agency. And BIA police and social services work together, and social services identify at-risk elders. And then when the BIA police don't have other calls to make, they drop in and visit the elders, just have coffee with them or talk with them for a while, and develop a relationship. And, you know, they'll take gifts at holidays or a meal at Thanksgiving, uh, you know, different things like that and build that relationship with the elders so that they're more apt to uh, ask for help from the, the police if they, if they need it. And the police are more apt to see something if, uh, you know, and changes and things like that when those visits. Uh, some of the other programs, you know, I think, any of those things that can do more of the community policing types of things through law enforcement, but also the elder protection teams, where if someone hasn't seen someone for a while and they're, you know, are concerned, can just ask someone on the team to do a drop in and check on things. Uh, those multidisciplinary teams can go a long way in uh, helping people to connect and, and address the situation before it gets to the point of being uh, health or life-threatening. Okay. And do you, do, you, do you work with adult protective services and, and guardianship? Uh, we provide resources and help connect people, but we don't work directly with them. Okay. The next question focuses on financial abuse of elders, which is becoming more frequent. Are, do you address this in the training and resources available? Yes, the, the financial exploitation module uh, really comes at it, for, and it's focused for people like that work in banks, merchants, uh, and anyone, casinos, workers, anyone that deals with any financial aspect as far as how they can recognize it and ways they might intervene and things that they can do if they notice something that is, uh, they have question about as far as an elder's finances. Okay. Are you aware of emergency shelters that are available for abused elders that they can turn to? Not specifically. I do know that uh, the National Center on Elder Abuse is working with the Department of Justice Office of Victims of Crime uh, and the, the Violence Against Women's Act uh, to utilize uh, domestic violence shelters. In some places, they, uh, some tribes use a uh, hotel to put the elder up in temporarily. Um, I think there's some creative things. I do know that there is uh, some violence against women that uh, money that is available for Department of Justice that tribes can apply for. And they've told me that they haven't received any, but they would love 
to receive some grant applications from tribes, and that can be used for victim services, uh, including possibly developing a shelter if there was a need for that much housing. Depends on you know how much someone may need. They may need to start with uh, having like a hotel or something like that that would be covered, and then as they build up the usage and more and more may be identified or needed than moving toward getting funds for development of the shelter. Okay, and this next question focuses on uh, grant writing and statistics. Uh, <laughs> are, are you aware of any uh, statistics that folks could use when writing grants for elder abuse um, for tribes or about tribal members? There isn't a whole lot. We do have uh, links to articles, and we have all the articles if someone wanted to contact us about uh, maybe sharing some resources with them. Uh, but there's not a lot of information out there about elder abuse. Also, the National Resource Center on Native American Aging on their elder needs survey, and I'm not sh I would guess that Navajo participates in that. Um, one of the when it looks at the serv uh, the services that are provided or could be provided, one of the questions was about elder abuse services, and you could actually have some some data from the elders in your tribe if you will go to that on how many use elder abuse services or how many would use it if they were available on your reservation. Uh, and I would work with the Title VI director to get that information. They have that report. That's the best I can do as far as you know tribal-specific information. It's not real focused, and it's pretty you know, just use of services and who would use them and who, you know, and or would use them. But it's about all we've got. We are working to uh, get some funding to develop a elder abuse survey that would be like that survey that we would have done by Title VI programs with the elders. And then we would be able to have more data on Native elders and be able to give tribes that information. But currently, there's nothing being done. Okay. This next question comes with a scenario. Um, this individual is a long-term care ombudsman. If a tribal member is placed in a non-tribal uh, land skilled nursing home, who would have jurisdiction? As far as being an advocate for an elder in that placement, um, who would be the person for that, for the ombudsman to contact? It would probably be uh, through the state adult protective services, but they could uh, involve the tribe if, you know, to help with that so that they could be there to help protect some of the elders needs or elders rights. But because it would be off tribal land, I think primary would probably be the state. I'm not an attorney, so I'm not the absolute authority on any of that by any means. Okay, this next question comes from an individual whose tribal nation recently implemented a tribal protection code. Um, elder abuse is prevalent in their in their nation. How is enforcement initially done, having just implemented their code? Yeah, one of the things that we've discovered is it's not just about passing a code, because once you have the code, then you need the policies and the procedures to do the investigation, the uh, Interve uh, intervention, the enforcement, all of that. And so those things have to be built right along following the code to say who's going to uh, investigate, who's going to uh, follow up, 
who has authority on different things. And uh, on the model code, I believe we have a presentation up on our website on developing the elder abuse model code or developing a code. And it goes through all those different steps that it can be laid out in the code who has all of those authorities. But still, if you don't have uh, adult protective services or someone that's going to be doing the investigation, you've got a code that's not enforceable. So those things have to work together. I'm learning a whole lot about policy I never knew as to the complexities of what all has to be done in order to make all of this work together. Is there a specific training for elder law attorneys that specialize in various forms of elder abuse? I know that the Department of Justice has had several trainings for prosecutors on uh, elder abuse. And that may be a good starting point to find out what else there might be for uh, for attorneys other than prosecutors. And if people will contact me, I'll try to help them connect with someone that can get them better answers. Okay, this next question is to any, are you aware of any tribes that combine foster, foster youth and elders to help heal each other? Not specifically. I know there are some, uh, there's, uh, Dave Baldridge has the Thousand Grandmothers program, but that's not specifically with elder abuse. That's with, with uh, grandmothers basically working with uh, younger mothers in developing or helping them to learn to parent. Um, I know there are some that do kind of a, a foster grandparenting with youth, that they come and work with an, an elder, you know, maybe through the senior centers and things like that, but I can't give you specific programs. And I'm glad we left a lot of time for questions because I know people have lots of questions that aren't covered on our website. So another question that's come in is, what efforts has IHS done towards addressing elder abuse? We've been working with IHS as they're trying to develop a policy for reporting of elder abuse with the inconsistencies across tribes and things like that. That makes it a little difficult. Uh, but Bruce Fink with Indian Health Service is trying to get a policy developed that they will be able to implement across the U.S. Is there a list of tribal ombudsmen across the nation? I think the Title VI program has a list of them. I do not. Again, if you have a question, please go ahead and type your question into the Q&A box. Okay, one question that has come in is,
Julie? I've lost is you. There me- oh, sorry. Oh, okay. The next question is, for folks who work directly with elders, is there mentoring or stress relief training for uh, caregivers? One of the things that we will have uh, are some suggestions on stress management or self-care on the caregiver module that we'll have up. Um, I know there have been various things on uh, caregiver self-care. We'll try to get something up on the website specifically about that that can be a resource. Uh, but I'm just drawing a blank right now. There, There is, let me say this, uh, with the National Resource Center on Native American Aging, they have developed a Native caregiver, a Native American care, elder, Native elder caregiver curriculum. I'll get it out. Uh, and that curriculum, I know, has been put into place in two of the tribal colleges here in North Dakota, but it has a lot of resources in there, and it's on their website, which is nrcnaa.org. Thank you. Thank Okay. The next question is, what are your suggestions for <coughs> the first the first step or even the next step uh, for a tribe that wants to do something about elder abuse in their community? I've seen a lot of elder groups come together and uh, work on letting their leaders know that this is something that needs to be addressed and work with those leaders to help develop what they want. The other thing that I would suggest is if you have a Title VI program that has done the Native Elder Need Survey with the National Resource Center on Native American Aging, uh, get with that Title VI director to get that data, that you can use that to uh, work and develop uh, a justification for what the elders' needs are, and addressing that with the leadership to start moving things forward. And, you know, we're happy to, you know, provide materials and things like that to any of those groups that want to get started with anything. This next question ties back into uh, your comments about bothering and disrespect. Uh, do you have any other tips or advice uh, for for lowering this information out of elders? Um, you know, I think just having having conversations about uh, and, and it's kind of a screening type of approach with you know has. You know, has anybody been hurting you? Can you tell me how? Has anybody bothered you? Well, how have they bothered you? Uh, To kind of get into that discussion about it, that just going directly, you know, have you been abused? You're going to get no and just move on. Uh, On some of the presentations that I have on the website, Um, In some of the later slides in those presentations, there's a series of questions and ways that you might ask some of that. So some of that's available if you want to look at it. I keep referring back to the website, but I think you'll find there's a lot of uh, really good resources up there that you can make use of. Okay, we have enough time for a few more questions. I'm going to go ahead and click the slide back to contact information. And if you have a question, go ahead and type your question into the Q&A box.
you know, we just kept mainly focused on the website today, but there are lots of other tangents we can go down with all the information. And like I said, there's probably more questions than answers, but we're doing our best. So I think this is a good question to, to leave off with. Are there any upcoming trainings offered by NIGI? We usually do several presentations at the Title VI conference in, uh, um, it's going to be in Denver the 1st of August this year for Title VI directors. Um, also, there's plans to present at the IHS Behavioral Health Conference. Uh, we don't have anything else right in the works right now, but that doesn't mean that you know, we won't be setting things up, and we try to keep those things up on the website as they're they're coming up. Another question that came in is, how do you become an adult protective services agency? Is it difficult? Uh, I would suggest contacting the... National Adult Protective Services Association to find someone that's more knowledgeable about that or the um, it's Kathleen Quinn and Andrew Capehart at the National APS Resource Center may be able to help more with that. They're one of our sister organizations. Any final, uh, Jack, Dr. Gray, any final comments um, you'd like to leave with everyone? Just any way that you can step in and start doing something helps. So even if you're starting with just making people more aware of elder abuse, start there, do something for World Elder Abuse Awareness Day. There are plenty of steps and plenty of things to be done, but start somewhere. And uh, any way we can be of a help, we will do that. Okay, we've reached the top of the hour. In closing, I would like to remind everyone that today's webinar was recorded and that the audio and PowerPoint will be made available online at CMS.gov. Thank you, Dr. Gray, for your time. And thank, thank you, everyone, you for joining today's webinar. Our session is now concluded.